Welcome everyone. This will be a very brief account of some aspects of Washburn's very early history. The town of Washburn is located in Rooster County of the state of Maine. Nathaniel Churchill is widely considered the first permanent settler of what we now call Washburn. Now here is a page from the 1840 federal census. Censuses are unpublished source documents. This census was pretty brief as it only described head of households and then the free and colored persons of that said household, which were divided into categorical age groups. Even though Nathaniel and uh, other settlers lived in the area since at least the mid-20s, it appears that the 1840 census is the first time Washburn appears as its own separate entity. Of course, it wasn't called Washburn quite yet. Here, let's zoom into the bottom right hand corner. Uh, here is Nathaniel's name, abbreviated to Nath or N A T H E. Uh, on the right hand side, it states Township 13 on the bottom and Range 3 uh, on the top. This is the first official name of what is now Washburn. Uh, this census shows that the population was approximately 64 members, and that the oldest resident was in their 60s but no more than 70 years old. Um, this document is significant because it's the earliest record of a distinct area of what would become its own town. It also shows that some of the first settlers of the region and uh, how few there actually were. Now, censuses in general are very good and reliable historical sources. They provide social and populational context to the subject at hand. Uh, this one only shows uh, location, head of household, and approximate ages, but later ones show uh, occupations, full names, ages, marital statuses, workplaces, so on. Um, these can then be used to see such things as labor force of an area or if there are uh, many immigrants from a specific location and uh, a said area. Uh, when many are compared with each other, censuses can show uh, po different populations of ages, uh, shifting, um, what families have become dominant over time, uh, for example. Now some of the strengths are that they are accurate and later on they provide quite a bit of detailed information. However, some of the weaknesses are that the older ones do not pr provide uh, quite as much uh, detailed information. Now, censuses are primary sources because they log and record information, uh, but they do not necessarily interpret them in any way. There are two main books. Uh, making them published sources that have been used in this video for historical information. Uh, the first is The Pioneer Homes of Washburn, Maine, written by William Tasker. This is a very interesting book that records the oldest buildings in Washburn uh, and the surrounding communities such as Parham and Wade and Krausville. It contains photos and histories of the families of each home. It also has a brief introduction of the founding settlers, including Nathaniel Churchill, the significance of this book is not just limited to architecture and buildings, although this in itself is very good. There is actually quite a bit of genealogical information as the building transitions from person to person or family to family uh, is recorded. The context of the book contains architectural history, but this expands into farm and work histories of each uh, farmstead. So it also contains the daily lives of different periods in Washburn's history. Some strengths are that this book deals with architecture of a specific location, which is fairly rare. The weaknesses are that some of the family histories that are provided might not be able to be verified. And it also provides information that can be substantiated um, through land deeds and titles, so that may require uh, some extra leg work, but still. It is mostly a secondary source describing uh, what life was likely like or what probably occurred based on the studies of the building uh, and the land surrounding it. But there is some primary source information such as uh, the dates uh, of land and deeds uh, changing hands uh, which can be verified. Um, likewise, the other book is Washburn 150 Years of Memories. Um, this would also be another published document and it was written by uh, Londa Brown and Louise Cole. It was a book celebrating Washburn's sesquicentennial centennial anniversary in 2011. It is full of photos, histories, memories, and lists regarding wa uh, the town of Washburn. It has some uh, good early history and incorporates many aspects of Washburn's history. It falls, uh, or excuse me, it tells the story of Washburn in a uh, generally 
chronological order, by era or uh, even decade, it is significant because there uh, has not been very many books specifically on Washburn uh, ever written, and the last one uh, before 150 Years of Memories was, I believe, a book written in the uh, late 80s by a man named Mr. Ray Carter. Now, the context of the book is mostly in the uh, local, regional, um, especially that of Arusta County, uh, and how Washburn has changed over time. The strengths of the book are that it uh, holds images, personal stories, a list of official positions, dates, and so on. It also tackles many different aspects of the town of Washburn, so that the breadth and scope uh, of the book is quite tremendous. Uh, the weakness of the book is that many of the uh, uh, vignettes uh, should be co uh, corroborated. Also, it is not uh, foolproof, so many of the uh, stated facts should be verified. Um, there is a noticeable discrepancy that I will be discussed later on, uh, but that does not mean the book is without merit. This is a, a general weakness of many secondary sources, such as this book. However, it also contains primary list of dates and names of positions uh, of offices in the town. The Crossville Pioneer Cemetery is the oldest cemetery of the locale. This is an image of the title of an online article written in 2006 about the cemetery. It is an article that has compiled all the information about the Pioneer Cemetery. Mostly, uh, it contains transcriptions of what is written on the gravestones. It helps tell the story of the area because it describes the first families of the time. Now, here is a map provided in the article. Notice how it is titled in Roman numerals uh, Township 13 R3 or Range 3. Um, this uh, article also shows the names of 33 people buried there, including Nathaniel Churchill and his second wife. His first wife is uh, transcribed on the stone of Nathaniel, but she is buried in New Brunswick, which is originally where she and uh, Nathaniel were from. Uh, this article is also significant because it shows that there was a diphtheria outbreak in 1862 where a total of 12 members of the community died between February, February and June of that year. Now the context of the source is about the early years of Township 13 Range 3, particularly in the uh, Krausville area, which, uh, which is today an unincorporated town, but uh, has been in the past known as East Washburn. It tells a little about uh, who they were, such as uh, with Christian scriptures and references on the stones, and also about a tragedy that occurred there. The strengths are that they provide exact transcription of the stones, and that they provide uh, information about each person. Some weaknesses are that the pic no pictures were taken, and that most of the biographical information is likely a family testimony and perhaps is unverifiable. Uh, most of the information is primary, such as the st stone transcriptions, and there is a little bit of secondary information that has already been interpreted uh, by the authors of the art article. Even though Nathaniel Churchill was the first settler, the Wilder family was probably the most important family in establishing Washburn into its own identity. What we have here on the right is a page from volume 2 of a four volume set of books entitled New England Families, Genealogical and Memorial, making it a published document. Uh, what it contains is a general geo genealogy of different New England families and surnames and their uh, corresponding family histories. Now let me zoom in here. There we go. Um, there is a mention of Isaac Wilder and it declares that he was the first person to have a sawmill in Washburn essentially starting the first business there. It helps tell the story of the town because it makes mention of individuals and their achievements. It also provides a uh, record for families and it lists all the children and goes on for uh, multiple generations. It is significant because this can be used to trace back families in time while at the same time describing uh, historical events that uh, each person in each town uh, accomplished or did. Now the context of this series is to provide a family history of New England, what each family has contributed to that general region, it demonstrates that uh, the living patterns uh, of certain families to separate regions through moving uh, or marriages as well. 
Now, the strength of the source is that it provides nearly complete family histories, which are very useful to genealogy, but at the same time describing local history in each different uh, area. Uh, some weaknesses are that since its scope is so large, um, the books uh, must be brief when regarding each person's uh, individual history. Also, sometimes little minute details may also be uh, disputed. For example, Isaac's birth year was more likely to be 1815 according to his own and a census record, not the 1813 year described here in the book. Um, at any rate, the books are loaded with essential primary source material that uh, is listed. Uh, before we move on, notice that Isaac's father was Theophilus, and that they uh, that they were from Pembroke, Maine, which is uh, south near the coast. Um, these uh, details will be important later on. Now here is a uh, another census, um, the federal census of 1850. As mentioned before, censuses are uh, unpublished source documents. This one provides a little more detail than the previously mentioned one as it provides uh, everyone's first and last name, uh, their age, gender, occupation, and birthplace. This one further tells the story of Washburn. Let's take a look, a close look at the top and bottoms. And we're going to be looking at the uh, encircled regions here more closely. Uh, notice that it states Salmon Brook Plantation as the uh, locale, um, not Township 13, Range 3. So sometime between 1840 and 1850, the area was officially named uh, after a particular tributary of the Rustic River, namely Salmon Brook. Uh, where Washburn is uh, built upon. Now, at the bottom, Isaac Wilder here is listed as age 35, uh, probably making his birth year 1850, or perhaps even 1840, but certainly not the 1813 mentioned uh, earlier in the uh, New England Family History book. Now, also notice that he's listed, oh, excuse me, listed as a carpenter, uh, not a uh, Farmer. This also corroborates the fact that he was the first uh, mill owner in Washburn. And also take note of uh, his uh, general uh, value, and that's three thousand dollars, which was quite a substant excuse me, quite a substantial amount of money uh, during this time period in the mid 1800s. Here we have the uh, Riverside Cemetery in Washburn. Uh, it's quite a large cemetery, and most of the buried there are from the uh, 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, there are relatively few additions in the last uh, several decades. Uh, most of the stones are upright and still legible, which is good, so it can be used as a good source for uh, genealogical history. Now, here is, yeah, here is Isaac Wilder's tombstone, um, which I guess we'll consider it as an artifact. Uh, as you can see, it is a towering figure um, that is much larger than any stone nearby. Uh, out of the whole cemetery of quite a few hundred, probably only I'd say about a handful might come close to it equaling its height uh, and stature, if they do at all. Uh, this immediately tells us that Isaac Wilder was either wealthy, influential, or both, and we of course know that indeed uh, he was, based on the census uh, record. Um, it tells a part of the, the, sto uh, the town's story because his stone and several nearby stones together represent a family that was integral uh, in Washburn's uh, early beginnings. It also s displays the significance of uh, who was buried uh, beneath it because of its monolithic uh, nature. Even if one did not know about Isaac Wilder, they could immediately interpret um, that he was a, a man of importance. And here, if we zoom in here, we can see that he died in 1881, and it says right here, age 66 years, takes 66 years off 1881, and that's more likely to be um, uh, 1815, uh, certainly not 1813. Now, the context of uh, 
this artifact source would be the the uh, uh, through the town's social history. This is because it shows status, uh, be it wealth or even just uh, mere prominence of a person, um, or or their family. Sometimes you can even uh, tell by extended families with a with a common surname. Um, the strength of cemeteries and gravestones are that uh, the families that are are usually buried together, and that people who lived in the same town are usually also buried together in the same cemetery, making it easy to go from person to person and then uh, know who uh, each individual was. Um, the weakness, uh, uh, the weaknesses though, are that uh, stones may become weathered or illegible or broken, uh, which means that the information that is provided uh, can't be used, or even that some inf sometimes information on them isn't available at all, like as in the stone uh, had nothing transcribed on it. Um, gravestones would be considered a primary source because uh, the information has uh, not been interpreted uh, by another person. All right, let's look now at three visual source photos representing uh, lumber work in the area at the time. Farming, while it was uh, common, especially as subsistence family farming, was not a very big uh, business enterprise in Washburn until the 1910s, 20s, and 30s when potato processing factories uh, became more readily available. Now this is an image of a lumber camp. Uh, the hand cut trees such as uh, the one on the ground uh, with hand axes such as the ones they're holding Usually the species of choice was uh, pine, and they would cut it down and float it down the river to, to a lumber mill, which would then convert it into shingles or lumber boards, something of that nature. Um, you can tell they probably work year-round. I mean, there's snow on the roof of their uh, camp shack here, so they worked in cold and harsh conditions. Um, they were likely self-sufficient based on all the tools and implements they have. They have lanterns, pails, there's a sawhorse there which is probably used to repair things if they ever got broken. Um, so I mean they had to depend on themselves to survive. Uh, this picture here is a picture of all the workers at Fairs Mill in the year 1894. Uh, so we can see here there's probably about two dozen men here. I mean that means Lumber was a pretty big deal in Washburn in the late 1800s uh, to employ that many people. Uh, Fair's Mill was owned by Johnson and Fair, and they were two businessmen from Presque Isle. And what they did was actually they purchased Isaac Wilder's uh, lumber mill. And it was actually Isaac's second mill. The first one burned down, but he rebuilt it, and then uh, Johnson and Fair bought it from him. Now this last photo here is a picture of that same mill from more of an, uh, I guess, distant aerial viewpoint. I mean, it just shows like how lumber had sort of evolved over time, and now it's uh, pretty big. I mean, it's a pretty big deal. It's, they got technology now. Uh, as you can see, it's more of like a factory sort of layout. Um, it just shows that. Uh, uh, the business has changed uh, in the time. Well, uh, the context of these uh, photos uh, show that labor uh, in the town was mostly mostly lumber related. Uh, I mean, of course, there was there each family probably had their own little farm, but it wasn't a big um, big operation usually. Um, it also shows that uh, Washburn interacted in, with uh, nearby towns such as uh, having Presque Isle businessmen coming in and uh, buying uh, the lumber mill. Um, the strengths of photos can be varied. First of all, the camera can't really lie, so there really isn't false information unless it's a doctored photograph. Um, they usually also provide, uh, usually inadvertent, uh, historical details that can provide uh, uh, more context, even if it wasn't uh, done on purpose. Um, the weaknesses of photos that usually they themselves do not provide any context. Um, that must be interpreted by uh, the historian. However, the photos by themselves are primary sources because as long as they're uh, original, um, they provide original content that hasn't been altered or uh, interpreted by another person. This map is a published source originally from an 1877 atlas 
The database where this was found was the United States Indexed County Land Ownership Maps from the years 1868 to 1918. And as I just said, this map was uh, from 1877. Uh, notice that it's called Washburn officially now uh, in the right hand corner above Township 13, Range 3. Um, the earlier provided map of Krausville um, was probably taken from the same atlas as um, the details are near identical. Uh, Krausville would be located about about here on this map, um, and as you can see, it's part of it's part of Township Thirteen, Range Three. Now, here, let's look in closely at just Washburn. All right, now downtown Washburn, if you could call it that, would be located right about here. The dark spot uh, encircled there is actually a body of water, and that is deemed the mill pond. And as you could probably guess, it's called the Mill Pond because originally one of the two first mills of Washburn was built uh, 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 by that body of water. Now if you look at the top corner here, we can see that there are four plots of land titled I. Wilder. And that, that would be Isaac Wilder. Um, now you can see that he had four pretty good sized plots of land because, as we know, he was quite wealthy. And after he sold his mill, we could probably assume that he uh, bought some farmland now. And uh, that's probably why he has quite a bit more than most people around him. Um, the next circle plot is uh, B. Wilder, and that's going to be Benjamin Wilder. And we'll get to him in just a minute. Now this map tells the story of the town because if you know who was who at the time, you could also see uh, what they owned and, and where it was. We can also see who owned the most. Um, this usually indicated wealth, as we just stated. Isaac Wilder was a very wealthy man, and that's why he probably has four uh, large plots of land. Um, now, the significance of such a land index, such as this, can also be uh, seen by demonstrating the growth of certain families or, or surnames, um, and just seeing how the town itself has sort of expanded and grown. The historical context is the local or regional status of the land it shows where the farms were uh, prevalent and how large they were in an agricultural community even though it was not yet a fiscally prominent enterprise this provides context on individual uh, farmsteads and the strengths of a map such as the, uh, this one is that they are uh, very accurate cause they are usually done by uh, a land surveyor and they do display uh, quite large areas uh, the atlas where this was taken from actually covers uh, the entire Arusta County. Now the weakness is that context is quite limited, um, such as we, we don't know what was grown on each plot or if anything was uh, grown there at all. So it, it might it's kind of hard to interpret uh, uh, on details. But uh, this would be a primary source because it's uh, an original document that... Uh, more or less just recorded uh, uh, information at the time. It's not an interpretation of the, the information. Alright, now to Benjamin Wilder. Some online sources claim that Isaac and Benjamin Wilder uh, were brothers. Um, this seems reasonable because they obviously have the same last name, their ages are fairly similar, and their birthplaces uh, are uh, close to each other. Isaac's being Pembroke, and here it says Benjamin's was Perry, and those are uh, two uh, adjacent towns. However, Benjamin was actually Isaac's nephew, and this can be verified from another excerpt from the New England Genealogical Book, as Benjamin here was a son of Robert Wilder, and uh, Robert Wilder was a son of Theophilus, and as you remember, Isaac was a son of Theophilus, so this Robert and Isaac were uh, brothers, making uh, Robert's son Benjamin Isaac's nephew. Um, note that in this record that Adeline um, becomes Benjamin's wife and that uh, Benjamin too had a brother named Robert, uh, so he had a father named Robert and a brother named Robert as this will be uh, important later on. Now on the right is an unpublished source document Benjamin Wilder's Civil War draft record. Uh, his name is the bolded one uh, near the bottom of the page. 
and states that uh, he resided in Washburn at the time he was drafted. Um, this partially describes a piece of Washburn history because it fought for the Union Army in the Civil War. Uh, all right, these are some of the names from Ancestry.com's Civil War Draft Record Database that fought from Washburn, Maine in the Civil War. Note that Salmon Brook Plantation was officially incorporated as Washburn in 1861 in honor of Israel Washburn Jr., who was the governor of Maine at the time. Now let's just take a look at a few, uh, some of these names and uh, some of the important things that happened to them. Um, Benjamin and his brother uh, Robert uh, both fought in the Civil War. Isaac Bates was 19 and Phineas Bates was 47 in uh, 1864, the year that they were drafted, likely they were of uh, some sort of relation to each other. They both died uh, in a Confederate prison camp. Thomas Bugby um, was promoted to quartermaster sergeant. Aaron Christie died in a Louisiana uh, prison camp uh, titled Camp Parapet. William Esty uh, was wounded in battle. John Fogg uh, eventually I uh, was promoted to sergeant major in the army. Charles Howes and both, or uh, and John McLaren, uh, both deserted from uh, the Union Army. Isaiah Randall uh, was wounded in 1864 and later died from uh, those wounds. Charles Simpson was also wounded, but he was uh, later discharged from the army. Uh, William Smith uh, also died in Louisiana presumably from a uh, prison camp. Uh, James Story uh, was promoted to a full quartermaster sergeant uh, during the Civil War. Uh, according to Washburn 150 Years of Memories, uh, it states that 44 uh, Washburn residents served in the Union Army, uh, 10 uh, died in battle, and 7 uh, uh, were wounded but survived uh, the war. Now, this information is significant because these documents show that Washburn was fully committed to the war effort and played their own part uh, in the Civil War. The context of these documents uh, are military as, as they describe Washburn's role at the national level as part of uh, the Union Army. The strengths are that they provide quite a bit of information, usually, and that they are reliable. Um, a weakness is that they only describe the individual and usually not their family. Uh, no family connection, so sometimes it's hard to identify a person even if their name is known, uh, if you cannot find a relation to another person. And these war documents are primary sources also because they are contemporary documents that have not been interpreted by others. Here is a photo of Benjamin Wilder from uh, Washburn 150 Years in Memories. It is, in the book, it is captioned as Benjamin Wilder, First Postmaster, 1860. Um, while I think the caption is incorrect, uh, let's just take a look at the photo for now. Um, it's a photo of Benjamin Wilder, and it was likely a professional photo based on the uh, blank background, um, lack of uh, any uh, other uh, items in the picture, as well as his posture and his uh, clothing. Uh, which is a solid black overcoat. Now it tells the story of Washburn because it shows one of the most prominent members of the town at the time uh, as if he was a postmaster. Uh, postmasters uh, back in the 1800s were uh, uh, leading members of the community. Um, it also shows like perhaps what uh, well-to-do uh, members of the community wore um, and also it kind of hints at some of the uh, the trending uh, hairstyles, apparently, as you can already see, his uh, long uh, beard there. Now, the context of the photo is um, uh, more of a, a personal one, as is a, a portrait of an important person in the community. Um, but this is uh, singled out to just Washburn. Um, and it's even more so just a single institution in that town, um, namely the post office. As stated before, photos usually lack context, but uh, what they um, do show is uh, 
definitely accurate if it's a unaltered photograph and they are primary sources uh, if they are not added to or interpreted themselves now on the right hand side there is a page from a volume titled US appointments of US postmasters 1832 through 1971 uh, this is an unpublished source document used for record keeping. Um, uh, what it is is a collection of books that kept records of every post office and who their postmaster was and when each one started the position. This tells us about a town story because a postmaster was a prominent position in the time period uh, that we are considering. So we could see uh, which individuals of a town were uh, of importance usually. It also It is also significant because the first creation of a post office indicates that a township or town is either prominent enough, large enough, or has established enough connections uh, with other communities to, uh, to need a, a post office to facilitate uh, mail. Now the context of such a source, a source would be generally restricted to each individual town, but the dates of each post office's creation demonstrate a larger regional context as well since they are uh, obviously interacting with nearby communities. Now the strengths of this source are that it is a reliable government document that shows a, a history of a specific town's uh, institution throughout time. Um, the weaknesses are that the, uh, the information is minimal at best and there is, ex uh, excuse me, there is next to no uh, immediate context. Uh, this is uh, a primary source since it's in its original um, it is an original information that has been recorded for uh, for uh, lo logistic uh, purposes, and it is not an interpretation of uh, the post offices or anything like that. Um, now let's go back to why I think the, uh, the caption that Benjamin was a postmaster is incorrect. Uh, let me underline a row here, and then we'll look closely at it. So we're going to be focusing in on this line here. All right, for Salmon Brook Post Offices, the first recorded name is Thomas Linton, appointed March 24th of 1858. Then it is Robert Wilder, and this is likely uh, to be Benjamin's brother, because uh, if you remember, uh, he had a brother named Robert, and his father's name is Robert, and this is likely uh, his brother Robert. And Robert Wilder was appointed June 4th, 1859. Um, Next in line is a man named Arthur Perry, appointed in, appointed in 1874, followed by Adeline M. Wilder, and this is indeed Benjamin's wife, and she was appointed in June of 1875. Now, either the caption in that said book is uh, incorrect, or whoever compiled this list um, is incorrect and wrote down the wrong information, which is uh, definitely possible. It just shows that you, uh, you must always be on the lookout for corroborating or conflicting uh, information from different sources. Now, you may be wondering uh, why it is still called Salmon Brook, uh, even though uh, officially it was incorporated as Washburn in 1861, and that's a good question. Um, here, let's look at another page, and this is the first time Washburn uh, shows up. Um, and this is later, in, obviously later in the volume. Now let me underline the uh, corresponding row that we're going to be looking at. And let's zoom in. Um, as you can see in the margins uh, on the left, it states Late Salmon Brook. Um, uh, which may be referencing that this Washburn post office and the following uh, line of postmasters was uh, once t entitled uh, Salmon Brook Post Office. Um, note that Benjamin's wife is, is still the postmaster at the beginning uh, in uh, 1879, and she remains the postmaster uh, until uh, 19, uh, or excuse me, 1881. Um, even if Benjamin was not the postmaster, though, um, he was still a prominent individual. Uh, in the town who ran a uh, uh, a general store and likely the post office was ran out of uh, his building uh, which would serve as the post office and the store um, now here's a photograph 
photograph uh, taken from uh, William Tasker's Pioneer Homes of Washburn. Um, and this is going to be considered a building source. Even though the caption reads 1915, the building was likely built in the 1850s. Because um, this was after Benjamin uh, moved to uh, the town of Washburn, uh, but before we have records of him opening his store. Now the building is fairly simple and most notably of the colonial revival style. Uh, many people were pioneers and settlers and perhaps likened themselves to northern Maine uh, colonists or something um, of that sort. The windows appear to be uh, quite symmetrical around the house, especially in the front. There is also a prominent uh, symmetrical dormer, uh, excuse me, dormer window um, projecting from the roof, um, and that is notable of the uh, colonial revival style. Uh, the pitch of the roof is also quite um, high uh, of the, that said style. Uh, notably, there is a raised portico with many columns encircling uh, two sides of the house, which is also uh, in line with the colonial revival style. Um, this shows that uh, many of the regular um, homes and households were likely of this style in Washburn at the time. It shows that the people were um, were simple and efficient rather than uh, going for overly decorated or, or fancy buildings. Now the context uh, of this uh, building fits into the excuse me architectural attitude of the local region, and, which was probably simple and practical, especially on account of large uh, snowfalls, uh, making it easier uh, for snow removal and such a, uh, things as that. Now the strengths uh, of such a source are that the uh, they can't really be false, and that they reveal uh, fairly uh, permanent landmarks. Um, they do not change much over time. Um, it is also a, a primary source because even if the photo was not taken immediately uh, after construction, um, it is still original uh, of the contemporary uh, setting of the time. Now here is a f yeah, here is a photo uh, of the same building today, and as you can see, um, the building hasn't changed hardly at all. Uh, in fact, structurally, it's uh, virtually identical. Um, if you read the caption now, uh, yeah, it's true that the uh, Washburn Historical Society now uh, uh, bases its uh, museum uh, from this building, and uh, you can visit there uh, there sometime if you want. Um, at the turn of the century, there was a turning point in Washburn's history. Uh, as uh, railroads came and trains came to, to the town. Now two companies, uh, the Aroostook Valley Railroad and the Bangor and Aroostook Railroad uh, competed for a railway in, in Washburn um, by racing to lay the tracks. Um, the Aroostook Valley Railroad uh, won the race and Washburn uh, uh, received uh, obviously uh, train uh, capabilities Washburn, in fact, was one of the, uh, actually, I believe it was the only um, town north of Bangor that actually had a, uh, a street trolley in the town um, as part of the deal. Now, I found this photo in an online uh, collection, and I, I found it fascinating. Now, uh, in this visual source, it's clear that this is obviously the head, uh, head car of a, a train, but... If you notice, obviously there it has a plow on it. <laughs> this immediately shows that the area at hand has uh, plenty of snow, and that this this uh, particular car uh, of the train uh, obviously went first and uh, cleaned the uh, rails off uh, after it snowed. Now, if you look at the uh, engine, it is not a, a coal-powered uh, locomotive, but appears to be actually be a large. Uh, electric diesel engine which puts the date of the train um, a bit into the 20th century so it was likely not uh, one of the original uh, trains uh, that arrived in Washburn uh, when the railroads first came because um, they were uh, certainly not of uh, uh, diesel engine trains now this photo helps tell the story of the town because it shows that uh, at the time train power uh, was definitely a uh, big deal uh, probably uh, being involved for both 
public and co commercial or business transportation. Now this is, uh, excuse me, this is significant because not all the towns um, in the area ha had trains um, that went through them, especially not passenger trolleys, uh, as we stated. Now the context of this source um, is mostly actually industrial uh, and commercial, as well as uh, a regional context. Th this is because the train must have operated to and from uh, other regional towns, either carrying freight uh, or passengers. So uh, we it, we can see that there is a uh, advancement in uh, how Washburn can interact with uh, nearby uh, communities. The pros and cons of photos. Uh, We've already uh, been described, and uh, once again, this is uh, still a primary source. Visual source photos that were taken of nearby town landmarks, namely the bridges needed to uh, cross the Aroostook River. The one on top is an older bridge that was built in 1902 and was used until 1971. There's a bridge before that but apparently it was destroyed by uh, the water and floating ice during a spring thaw. Even before that, uh, a ferry was needed to uh, cross the river. The bridge on the bottom is the more modern bridge and is currently the one uh, that is used today for uh, traffic. Um, this one was built uh, and commissioned the, the same year the other one was discontinued. Besides the bridges, you can see the beautiful Aroostook River and perhaps why the first settlers settled down uh, here in Washburn, such as the access to clean water, the countryside, and uh, most importantly, the rich, dense forest. Also, in the theme of telling a town story, the earliest bridges demonstrate an early need for the residents to move across the river to interact with others on the other side, uh, whether that was for personal reasons or business dealings. This is significant because if it was simply land uh, that was needed early on, it could have been uh, easier done by not crossing the river and expanding uh, on, on the Washburn side of the river. But the bridges show that there must have been a lot of interaction with neighboring communities um, early on in the town's history. The historical context is a regional one regarding the area's population and industry as well as its internal infrastructure. This is especially so since the bridges are certainly not cheap to build and require um, a lot of effort uh, to construct. Washburn also had an early history of fraternal orders uh, in the community, with both the Odd Fellows and the Freemasons establishing themselves in the 1880s. Here is an early mention uh, of both fraternal organizations, of which this man, Maurice Russell, belonged to in the late 1800s. This excerpt was taken from a published source document, uh, a book written by uh, Harry Coe, main biographies, excerpted from main resources, attractions, and its people, um, written in the 1920s. It tells a little, about, a little bit about daily life for an active community member. This particular book is arranged uh, more by people rather than by locale, so sometimes it is hard to uh, hard to gauge uh, the Washburn history uh, through each individual's history. However, it is significant due to its seemingly insignificant details about people's lives since it does include information such as involvement uh, with the independent order uh, of fellowship uh, and we see that is uh, active then in the town. Uh, the historical scope and context of this book is how each individual contributed or related to the state as a whole uh, community in general rather than just simply um, uh, their uh, neighborhood and community. It would also incorporate many uh, aspects of history such as the social, the political, and uh, sometimes the economic history of the state. The strengths of this source are that it overviews many people uh, in many locations on many different topics regarding the entire state of Maine. The weaknesses are that um, all the specific information might not be 100% accurate since it covers such a vast uh, amount of information. It is likely uh, discrepancies probably appeared, um, especially in the 1920s when it was written since all this information would have to be gathered by hand. 
Also, personal biases of, of many writers in this ta uh, time period must also be uh, accounted for. Um, this is mostly a secondary source since the material is largely interpreted uh, from uh, all other sources. Um, now here if we zoom in, uh, on the right hand side you can see that uh, uh, Washburn had a chapter of Royal Arch Masons, Caribou had Royal Select Masons, um, and then there's the Independent Order of Odd Fellows uh, in Washburn. Um, so clearly Washburn did have uh, connections uh, with fraternal organizations uh, even outside of its own uh, community. Now here um, is a great example of unintended details providing uh, history um, and this can be seen in this artifact, a, a postcard of the Washburn Street Trolley actually. Um, in the corner, the bottom right hand corner is dated at 1938 and we can see two buildings, the trolley, electric wires, and part of what looks to be a uh, some sort of wagon. Um, some of the little details in the postcard are interesting. The trolley car is numbered at number 51, so that means there were likely a minimum of 51 cars in the Aroostook Valley Railroad Company. Um, which is quite quite a number for uh, this region of Rooster County. Also note that the building in the background um, and how it is labeled uh, IOOF for Independent Order uh, of Odd Fellows. Um, also notice that there are three chain links uh, a little bit below, which was the the Odd Fellows uh, symbol. This shows that the law, uh, the the Odd Fellows Lodge, was quite large. Was also located on Main Street of Washburn because that is where the street trolley was located. Dem this demonstrates how prominent was it must have been in the town, as it uh, that currently is not there now. In fact, uh, it is a parking lot right now. <laughs> um, now this tells a story because it shows that many people thought of Washburn and. Uh, what was important enough about it to be put on a postcard so obviously the street trolley was especially since it was the only one north of Bangor you know that was a prominent attraction that Washburn had and made it unique uh, in the community now the context of the source is both local and, and abroad because the postcard represented a part of Washburn that could be sent anywhere and the recipient of the postcard uh, would likely know a little bit about Washburn no matter where they lived whether it was in a nearby community or uh, far away. Now the strength is, uh, of this source is that it captures many unintended details that are valuable, uh, but likewise this is also its weakness since uh, little actual information is uh, provided on purpose. Uh, basically all we have is the uh, written information on the trolley and on the building, as well as the caption of the postcard itself. Oh, and also note that um, a postcard would be considered a primary source document as it is original content and the uh, image itself um, has not been altered in any way or interpreted. Now let's look at some visual sources for another uh, fraternal order of Washburn. The Freemasons um, were, were prominent uh, early on and continued to, to be so in the community. They started about the same time as the Odd Fellows, and even rented out um, the same building that the Odd Fellows um, owned uh, on Main Street for some time. Now, here's a picture of their current lodge, and if we zoom in here, there we go. We can see their placard on the building, which states Washburn Lodge Number One Hundred Ninety Three. The AFAM stands for Ancient Free and Accepted Masons. We can also see that the building was built in 1966, so it is a fairly um, modern building. Back in uh, Riverside Cemetery here, there we go, um, there are numerous, numerous individuals with the uh, Masonic symbol on their tombstones. Uh, here is one that was taken from C.L. Stoddard's gravestone, which was set two places to the right of the same row where Isaac Wilder's stone is, 
is located. Here we can clearly see the Masonic symbol with the compass and the square, but also notice the three chain links with the letters FLT in them. Um, as you probably remember, the chain links are the symbol for uh, the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, and the FLT stands for Friendship, Love, Truth, uh, which is the uh, Odd Fellows uh, motto. And this shows that uh, Maurice Russell was not alone in belonging to most, um, excuse me, multiple fraternal organizations, and also this shows that both orders were likely very active in the community. The context of these visual sources are socio-political. These showed the involvement of different social groups in the town and how the community also involved themselves with the orders. The strength of these sources are that they are readily identifiable, such as with the Masonic symbol or the chain link. Um, however, uh, they can be weak because little information and context is provided with the images. Uh, they are also primary sources because they are images uh, of the original forms of of the buildings or of the stones. To wrap up our very brief survey of early Washburn history, we will take a look at, at an image of a school and we'll consider this a building source. Um, now this, is, uh, this school was titled Free High School and it was the first consolidating school that was built in Washburn. It was constructed in the year 1910. Previously there were quite a few numerous small um, one uh, one room schools, including one in the town hall of Washburn. Um, this particular school um, lasted until 1935, in which it uh, burned down, which truly is a shame, as this was a, a beautiful building, especially considering it was a school building. The building itself seems to be a cross between the colonial revival style and of the Greek revival style. Um, it is similar to the colonial style, such as uh, Benjamin Wilder's house that we observed before, because it has a excuse me because it has a very very symmetrical setup, and that goes from the front uh, and side windows as well as the, uh, the central door. There are many door windows of the colonial revival style, and they too are symmetrical with each other. Uh, however, the school is also Greek revival in nature. Uh, most notably because of its semicircle forming round columns atop several raised steps. Um, there's also a portico, in this case in the form of a uh, semicircular balcony upheld by these columns. The roof is also Greek in style because of its uh, characteristically low-pitched roof, which was fairly uh, uncommon uh, for this area. This tells that the town at the time saw a need for a school uh, and they went above and beyond for a grand school building. They also likely took pride uh, in, in education and wanted to provide a good education for their children by willing to uh, take on such an endeavor. The context of the source would be architectural because of the, it supplements the previously mentioned colonial style um, that was prominent in the area, but also shows that the people were, uh, excuse me, were willing to branch out for more prominent uh, constructions. Um, it is also of an educational context because it shows a building where students from multiple communities uh, went to go for high school. The strength of the source is that it shows a building that doesn't exist anymore um, as it burned out in 1935, so it is one of the only possible ways of still appreciating it. Its weakness is that um, almost n no context really is given besides uh, the name and location uh, of the school. Now, this photo uh, would also be a primary source since it is a, an original uh, source uh, of the building and it is uninterpreted by uh, 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 outside people. Well, this has been a very, very brief survey of the early history of Washburn. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for watching.